The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Clothes with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Thursday the 11th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe this hour? Let me tell you, the Belarusian president, Alexander Lushenko, threatening to shut down a key pipeline that moves gas from Russia into Europe. Unsurprisingly, prices rise. UK growth data slows in the third quarter, leaving a rate high from the Bank of England, a finely balanced decision this year. The European Commission warning that inflation will actually slow sharply in 2023 to below the ECB's target. In the luxury sector, Burberry shares battered as revenue growth shows sharply. Try saying that quickly. Uh, what will the trench coat maker's new CEO do to turn, turn things around? Wow, struggling with this one. We're going to check out that story <laughs> a little bit later on in the program. Uh, let's talk about where we are with the markets back on safe ground. Uh, equities bid, uh, there you go. We're back to 485, 485 spot 24. So equities on the front foot here in Europe. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, Alex, the dollar is also on the front foot. Euro dollar with a 114 handle. People are talking about a 113 handle sometime soon. And the reason why it's funny the guy couldn't pronounce that is because he was giving me so many problems in the break about mispronouncing names. So, ha ha, hot kettle black. Okay. Here in the U.S., I'm calling it beauty and the gold, the up and the downside of the market. So Disney down by 8%. You're looking at the worst loss for the stock uh, since December of 2020 after they just didn't get the kind of subscriber growth that we're looking for. On the flip side, Freeport, McMahon, and Copper and Gold, second best performer on the S&P, up by 9%. Uh, part of that's Copper's having a really nice move today. Gold's also having a nice move today. All of that in terms of an inflation hedge. We'll look at the potential upside as inflation keeps picking up later on in the show. Guy was mentioning dollar index, a highest since November of 2020. And then crude also up by eight tenths of 1%. We're all kind of waiting on tender hooks to see what President Biden actually does. OPEC came out and said we are seeing some demand destruction. They're still looking at surplus uh, in the beginning of next year. So how do we bridge this gap from now until then? A question we'll also talk about later on in the hour, Guy. I think we've got plenty of potential for pronunciation errors oh, throughout happening. the rest of the it's, show. It's, so it's uh, I'm not, we're not there yet. <laughs> Victory has not been declared. <laughs> Uh, OK, let's talk about what is happening in Europe right now. Germany recording more than 50,000 new cases in one day. That's the first time that's happened. German Chancellor in waiting, Olaf Scholz, meanwhile urging more people in Germany to get vaccinated. Sam Fazelli, Senior Pharmaceuticals Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us now. What needs to happen next? What do you make of the trajectory that we are currently seeing in key parts of Europe? Ugly, Guy, ugly. When I'm looking at them here on my screen, per capita numbers are very high. But don't forget, Germany is only just um, still bit slightly below that of the United Kingdom. But Holland, Belgium, Austria, they're all shooting up to levels that I don't think even the United Kingdom saw during this past um, case rise. So unfortunately, this is, I think, what's going to happen. Highly concentrated populations and the cold weather is setting in. And vaccination rates are not that high on a relative basis. A quick follow on that, Sam. Where, if vaccination rates aren't as high, where is the booster conversation? Yeah, so the booster conversation, I think, is definitely a lot further ahead in the UK and, and, and France to a degree than uh, really in Germany and some of these um, other countries that we just mentioned. So there's, I, I think, non pharmaceutical innovations is the way to go. Masking has got to come back in. All right, Sam, thanks a lot. Uh, Sam Vizelli of Bloomberg Intelligence uh, joining us uh, there. OK, well, but also what we're paying attention to talking about oil, let's go to gas prices. So Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko is threatening to shut down a key pipeline carrying Russian gas to the European Union as the bloc considers new sanctions. Now, this escalates a dispute over migrants seeking to cross from Belarus into the EU. We want to break it all down and what it means with Bloomberg's Alexander Gruditsky from Kiev, Ukraine. Alexander, uh, what happened and where are we in this negotiation? Uh, well, uh, to give you some basic idea, geographically, Belarus is a country which is sandwiched between Russia and the European Union. Its president, Alexander Lukashenko, has been in power for 27 years, and he faced unprecedented protests against his rule last year. Um, uh, today, he threatened to shut down a key pipeline which carries natural gas from Russia to Europe and, most importantly, to Germany. Uh, the European Union, which hasn't recognized Lukashenko's victory in last year's elections, 
now threatens him with uh, even more severe sanctions if he doesn't stop thousands of migrants from uh, Middle East from entering Belarus and then literally trying to jump across the border into neighboring Poland and Lithuania. Um, today, several thousand people, including children and, and women, are stuck on the border with Poland, um, causing uh, something which starts to remind a major humanitarian crisis. The United States also said they are planning more sanctions against Belarus, and Russia, which is Lukashenko's major, major ally, so far did not comment on his natural gas ultimatum. Ultimately, this is Russian gas that is going through those pipelines, so it'll be interesting to see exactly how they do react. Uh, Alexander, thank you very much indeed. Alexander Kudritsky uh, joining us from Ukraine. Uh, let's turn our attention to what is happening in the UK. The economy growing a little less than forecast in the third quarter. Consumer spending also showing some signs uh, of weakening. Bloomberg UK economy reporter Lizzie Burden joining us now to talk about what this means, particularly for the Bank of England. Is this in some way vindication of the governor's decision not to vote for a rate hike a couple of days back? Yes, kind of. The monthly figures came in slightly above forecast, but the quarterly figures for the third quarter came in just below the forecast. Uh, and it's the quarterly numbers that the Bank of England really cares about. So they showed there was a significant slowdown from the second quarter when you had that rapid rebound from the winter lockdowns. And momentum slowed partly because of supply disruptions. But remember, as you say, it was the risk of choking off the economic recovery that put the Bank of England off hiking rates at its November meeting last week. And these numbers are so close to the Bank of England's updated forecast that they'll probably buttress market expectations of a rate hike soon, if not next month. So the attention will now turn to the inflation and jobs numbers that come out next week. All right, Lizzie, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joining us. And then that really leads us uh, to the next part of the story, and that's U.S. inflation here in the, in the U.S. is at a harbinger for the euro area. We're going to talk to Agnes Belesh, uh, Bearings, the chief European strategist, coming up next. This is Bloomberg. You are looking now at a live shot of Arlington National Cemetery. We're waiting for President Biden and the First Lady. They'll be coming there to participate in the Presidential Armed Forces Full Honor Wreath Laying Ceremony on the centennial anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And then President is expected to deliver remarks and observation of Veterans Day. Guy? The President will be arriving shortly. Uh, we will bring you pictures when he does. Um, let's turn our attention back to what is happening with the economy and the markets. We certainly saw a shock yesterday for many when it came to the inflation number that was delivered out of the United States. In Europe, the debate feels a little less inconclusive at the moment. Um, we find ourselves in a situation where in the UK inflation is running pretty hot. Uh, in much of the Eurozone, though, uh, it remains elevated and then is expected to fall, according to the European Commission, fairly sharply, certainly by 2023, back to below the 2% uh, that the ECB targets. Uh, Agnes Belesh, uh, Bering's chief European strategist, joining us now. How, Agnes, should I think about inflation in the Eurozone? Uh, it is certainly a hot debate on the governing council of the ECB. It certainly doesn't feel as hot as what we are seeing over in the United States. My question is, will it become so? Yeah, so um, the inflation dynamics uh, in Europe is a little bit different from what's happening in the US. There's no labor shortage that's uh, pushing wages up and the supply side bottlenecks are, are not as bad. Um, for, for, for goods arriving in Europe uh, from Asia, they're coming from the Middle East with the Suez Canal and they're uh, arriving in the Mediterranean and unloading there in the ports. There's no shortage of truck drivers and if they were, there are also very good rail networks. Um, so the, the, the common point with the U.S. is what you were discussing just before, actually, which is uh, the energy price shock. And, uh, and about half of the 4.1% October inflation that we saw in the euro area was actually coming from uh, the rise in oil prices, about 25% year on year from deflation last year. So I think this is the key right now to determine what's happening uh, with the euro, euro area inflation. Uh, so 
We had today, and in some ways, I guess this is no surprise, Governing Council Member Robert Holtzman uh, talking about how the fact that you could see the ECB stop buying bonds as early as next September if inflation looks to have uh, sustainably returned to the official target. What's the risk of a policy mistake from the ECB? Obviously, Holtzman's going to be hawkish. Obviously, uh, German members are going to be hawkish. But what's the risk? Yeah, so... The ECB has not changed stance. There is nothing that's happening that will make it change stance. But you are absolutely right that this is my biggest fear, in fact, that the market misunderstands uh, the end of the emergency bond purchase program uh, in March 22 uh, as a sort of tapering decided on purpose by the ECB um, and, uh, as, and taken as a tightening on financing conditions that would be take, you know, as, interpreted as a change of stance. But in fact, there still is the standard asset, as, uh, asset purchase program that's going on, and it might be added to it a little bit from what remains in the envelope of the emergency purchase program. But it's very important that that is well communicated because the ECB although it has doves and hawks, um, has not seen anything that will make it change its, its, uh, its mind. It is so close to its holy grail of changing the trajectory of inflation closer to target. And this is probably what's keeping it up at night, not missing this opportunity of not returning to secular growth, but taking the chance of propelling European growth into a new higher growth trajectory. Hmm. Agnes, just hold that thought for a moment. Uh, I want to direct our audience to, to what is happening at Arlington. You're looking at a live shot from the Arlington National Ceremony. The President of the United States, President Biden, and the First Lady participating in the Presidential Armed Forces Full Honor Wreath Laying Ceremony on the centennial anniversary of the tomb of the unknown soldier. Uh, the President is expected to deliver remarks uh, in observance of Veterans Day. It used to be called Armistice Day, now Veterans Day, uh, the 11th day of the 11th month. Um, we will continue to monitor what is happening at Arlington. Agnes, let me come back to you and continue our conversation about what is happening inside the Eurozone. I was talking to, we were talking to Lance Fritz a little bit earlier on. He runs one of the biggest railroad operations in the United States. He was saying that the US is seeing higher inflation because it's seeing better growth. It's got better growth. To what extent is that true? The reason the US has an inflation problem is that growth is running rampant right, na right now. Is that something that we should be worrying about in Europe? Have we understimulated rather than overstimulated the economy here? Okay, so, so I totally agree with that point. Growth is higher, and what is stopping it right now are supply-side bottlenecks, high energy prices, uncertainty, the virus still roaming around, and insufficient vaccinations, if not insufficient booster shots. So all this is, is quite well understood. There is room for the economy to expand in the U.S. when this is resolved, but also in the euro area, which is also affected by these energy price shocks and global disruptions, really. There is sort of a perfect storm of relatively independent events that are hitting uh, global growth right now and hitting Europe, of course, um, as well. So I, I just do see um, enough demand drive in Europe with a very high excess savings uh, pushing it that's actually being well interpreted by uh, stock markets. And, and there is no reason really to think that the fiscal stimulus is what is missing to the European growth dynamics. We know actually that in 2022, these next-gen funds will be deployed. And in fact, um, this will support a really high growth next year, 4.5% uh, in bearings. We are actually a little bit above consensus, which is around 43 and, and I saw the commission today actually uh, upgraded its, uh, its 22, 20, uh, 2022 growth forecast to 4.3, uh, so not so far from ours as well. So I think Europe has all the cards in its hands to grow quite well, and European equities are showing that, uh, you know, they're quite positive about earnings ahead. So tell me then about the risk that you might see in relation to China. I mean, talk about soaring prices. Look at the PPI, right, the highest that we've seen in decades. Um, you also have that zero tolerance COVID policy in China. So that feels like that could be a growth crimp as well. The property sector is going to be pretty heavy. Um, you saw exports really good, but imports struggling a little bit. And that's going to be very much tied to, say, Germany and the potential growth rate and inflation to Germany. How do you see that dynamic playing out next year, despite the fact that we do have that fiscal impulse coming down? Yeah, so the slowdown in China, you're right, is 
is a big concern, but it's really important to understand what's going on there. So they are changing growth model, reorientating the economy towards a domestic consumption, but the way they are doing that is by supporting the middle class. This is the concept of common prosperity, right? And, and the middle class in China is the largest in the world, and they will now benefit from a warm social safety net blanket from the government with better education services, with a pension fund, pension reform, so that you know there will be a way for for the household to have retirements when they stop working, um, re retirement uh, pay payments when they stop working, better health services as well. So the the goal there is to help it desave and actually boost consumption, domestic consumption as an internal driver of growth. Um, as opposed to, to investment. So this should not be bad. This should not be a headwind, actually, for those exporters that sell in China, be it uh, from Europe, but in particular from Germany, who exports probably 8% of its total exports to China or France, uh, which, which, this, which, uh, which put, has about 5% of its exports uh, to China. Agnes, do you see European equities going even higher from here? We're at, what, 485 on the stock 600 today. We are at record highs. European equities are, are taking out record highs. It's been a longer journey than we've seen over in the United States. How much is left in the, in, in the tank right now? The markets seem to be giving us the signal that they think there is more ahead. So estimates, so, so earnings were beating estimates, and probably estimates are being revised down slow, you know, defensively but but there is so much slack and so many disruptions still ongoing in the economy that there might be a second impetus next year that comes through maybe in the middle of the year when some of these disruptions are removed when these booster shots are given when vaccinations in the ems are uh, have advanced uh, more satisfyingly and and as well when you know all these inflation pressures that are keeping uh, consumers um, uncertain and, and insecure and precautionary with our savings, we peter out. And and since Europe is lagging behind and is having so much, so much quality in its in its uh, in its offering, there, there is no reason to think that uh, European equities couldn't do well actually and surprise uh, the rest of the world because usually uh, the U.S. <clears throat> are those uh, expected to grow fast, but not European markets. Yeah, very much echoing the view of Goldman Sachs, too. Also very positive on European equities from earnings and margins. All right, Agnes, thanks a lot. Agnes Belaish, uh, Bearings Chief European Strategist, thank you very much for joining us. All right, coming up, let's stay in the prospect here of European earnings. Siemens posting a beat on profit. The German industrial giant expecting to reap benefits of years-long streamlining initiative that rival GE is just starting to get into and to copy. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. London's Heathrow Airport is seeing what it calls the first green shoots of recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. The airport plans to hire more than 600 staff following the end of the U.S. travel ban. Heathrow is recruiting offices, engineers and other operations positions. Passenger levels are still around 56% down on pre-COVID levels. And Uber is raising its base fares in London by 10% so it can attract more drivers. Customers have complained on social media of longer waiting times, cancellations and higher fares during peak times. Uber says it needs about 20,000 more drivers in London to help return service to normal. And Siemens expects profit margins to increase across its three main divisions next year. The German engineering giant is re reaping the benefits of years of streamlining, a process that rival General Electric is just starting. We are two steps ahead from that perspective, as we correctly said. And of course, we get a question, why are we holding our shares in Siemens Energy or in Health News? And on the other side, we are also working together on certain technology fields. So therefore, I do believe the way how we are set up is quite well. Siemens spent much of the last decade spinning off units such as healthcare and its gas turbine division. And that is your latest business flash, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ridica. Let's get more on that. It's a really interesting compare and contrast. We're joined by William Wilkes, uh, Bloomberg Industrials and uh, Transportation Reporter. William, is it a fair 100% compare and contrast between the two? Um, I think... It, it, perhaps not 100 percent but there's a lot of similarities between these two companies like they they have big healthcare businesses they're big in energy and turbines obviously ge has its aviation business but um 
um, yeah, these are two companies that compete in providing industrial services. And I think a comparison is fair. Why did it take GE so long to see what Siemens were doing and figure out that it was the right way to go? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, GE has obviously been struggling for years and I think it's, it's very difficult when you have these big old historical companies to, you know, buy the bullet and say, we, you know, we need to do some like really serious surgery here. Um, Siemens were very forward thinking about this. Um, it was not hugely popular in Germany at the time, this breaking up the conglomerate thing. They really, you know, were, were pioneers at doing this, and it's, it's definitely paying off for them now. So going forward, over the past year, uh, GE has outperformed Siemens, for example, um, which I find to be quite interesting. And I wonder what the next catalyst uh, for Siemens is going to be, considering that the industrial watchers are really going to be looking at GE and how that spinoff winds up taking place. The next, I mean, the next cap, that, that's true, Siemens has not performed so well over the, as, as well as GE over the last 12 months. I think what Siemens really needs to do is boost its profitability. And that's what they, that was, it's the defense they give for having broken up their conglomerate structure. Now you see all these individual divisions, there's a lot of visibility there, and management can concentrate on boosting profitability at those. Uh, Siemens still lags some of its competitors on margins and share price, and the management yep. team really wants to, to sort that out. William, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for the analysis. Greatly appreciated. Bluebox William Wilkes on the comparison, the side by side between Siemens and GE. Alex, what I thought was interesting is that what, what really stood out to me today with the Siemens numbers was the digital side. And, and I. And this is fascinating because there is this often sort of well-aimed criticism of German industry that it is not fully digitised, that it is not digitising quickly enough, that it has not embraced the, the whole sort of digitisation that we're seeing in the industrial sector. Siemens has. Siemens was much more forward-thinking in its approach uh, and, and really has been a standard-bearer for German industry uh, in terms of digitising. There are many businesses that desperately need to follow, but those numbers really stood out to me today. Yeah, but I guess the question is, does it need to get better faster? I don't want to take away from the fact that it has this business and it is doing well. Yep. Um, but software is still only 10% of their sales. And I guess I wonder how quickly uh, they can r r to I increase it. Do they need to look at that kind of structure again? How do they juice it up a little bit? Well, they do. And I think that is the, the, the kind of the question that every CEO asks themselves. And the answer is always, yes, we need to get better. We need to do it faster. Uh, but digital in Germany is one of the kind of the key areas that the country really needs to focus on. The whole industrial sector needs to focus on. You look at what's happening in the auto sector as well. Uh, another company that has uh, certainly struggled today here in Europe, Burberry. We'll talk about it next. This is Bloomberg. So we're wrapping up the day here in Europe, um, taking a look at where stocks are. We are finishing regular trading, going into the auction process. Uh, and let me assure you, in just a moment, what we're going to see is a map that is showing quite a lot of positivity. But the interesting thing here right now uh, is that as we zoom in on Europe, uh, we have a fairly mixed story. It, it is positive. We've got fresh record highs on the stock 600. We'll get there eventually. The geography will be sorting itself out. There we go. Uh, what is happening right now is the, the CAC's up by two tenths of one percent. The DAX is absolutely flat. But the FTSE is outperforming. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. I shall dig into the details in just a moment. Uh, so now that we've got the map settled, let's move on to our next chart, which is the second chart of the stock 600, uh, which has pushed up very nicely uh, as this day has gone on. We're up by three tenths of 1%. 485.30. That's another record for the stock 600. It was interesting to hear uh, what we were uh, talking about in our last conversation with Agnes Bermarsh, talking about the fact that maybe there's still potential uh, to run a little bit higher. We're just ticking a little bit lower, actually, uh, as we come through the close. It's going to be interesting to see what the auction delivers. Yesterday, quite a big spike during the auction. Uh, let's break it down from a sector point of view, because actually I think this is where things get interesting. The record highs are nice, but actually the sector rotation story is where the granularity and the detail come in. Uh, the, the mining sector is doing well. Um, so you've got the big miners, the big integrated miners doing really well. They're certainly picking up on the back of what we're hearing from China and elsewhere and the inflation narrative. But actually what you're also seeing is the gold miners having a really cracking week. Gold started to pick up again. Gold, very much on the front foot, translating into the mining sector. That's what we're seeing there. Uh, the sector is up by 3.66%. 
one of the reasons why London is outperforming. Uh, bottom end of the market, travel and leisure. Um, the reason for that is that we are seeing quite a significant pickup uh, in the number of cases around Europe. And that's starting to maybe alarm the travel sector a little bit. Uh, I think there were some flights out of Germany today, some flights out of Russia today uh, that were blocked going into China. There are just concerns about the numbers we're seeing here. And maybe that will reverberate. Uh, remember, we started the week by reopening the North Atlantic. Uh, we're heading into the end of the week really concerned about what is happening with the COVID story. So let's talk about some individual names. Siemens, absolutely cracking set of numbers. We were talking about them a little bit earlier on. Uh, I thought the digital side of the business was absolutely fascinating, but the compare and contrast with GE is interesting. Auto Trader. What is Auto? If you live here in the UK, you know what Auto Trader is, but for the rest of uh, the world, let me explain. This is basically a business that is a car marketplace. And online, it used to be not online, it used to be magazines, but now it's a car marketplace, a digitized marketplace for cars, secondhand cars. As we all know, second-hand cars are certainly holding up in valuation. Alex bought hers a little while ago, Jasper, the green car. Others certainly <laughs> uh, are delving into the second-hand car market in a fairly big way. And, and valuations are certainly uh, doing really well. So trying to find a second-hand car at the moment, really tricky. Uh, so auto trader benefiting from that. The stock up by 14.25%. And then there's Burberry. Is Burberry a luxury stock? Is Burberry not a luxury stock? It certainly doesn't feel like it's generating the kind of revenue, top-line kind of numbers that you would expect from a luxury stock. We're certainly not seeing that. And this is an industry that focuses on the top line. It's not generating those kind of numbers. It's about to get a new CEO. What's going to happen there? But certainly today's numbers were not good from a market perspective that does focus on the top line. Burberry being marked down really quite hard at the moment. Stock down by 5%. Alex. That was amazing. There was a pregnant pause. There was a setup. There was a question. Let's get to it. Uh, <laughs> more on Burberry. We're joined now uh, by Sweetha Ramachandran, GAM Investment Manager. Sweetha, um, Guy set it up. Powerful question. Is Burberry a luxury stock or no? Yeah, certainly in terms of how it's behaved, uh, it wouldn't seem like one. If you consider the top line growth that, uh, say, the likes of LVMH and Air Hermes are showing on a two-year stack. Both those businesses, the fashion and leather goods at uh, LVMH as well as Hermes, uh, are up nearly 40 percent, you know, year on uh, a year over two years. Whereas Burberry is flat. So this gulf between the winners and the laggards in the sector is really widening quite markedly at the moment. Um, and Burberry is sort of stuck in the middle. We even have the affordable luxury players in the U.S., for instance, Capri, which owns Michael Kors, Tapestry, which owns Coach, which uh, beat and raised guidance today. Uh, so it's stuck in the middle. It's neither kind of in the top tier of luxury, neither is it affordable luxury. Uh, so I think that's the question mark is where it goes from here. I got a bigger question for you. Why is Burberry still an independent business? Indeed, in the 20 years of it uh, being listed, it has seen five CEOs, which is a pretty high management turnover for a luxury business where these businesses pride themselves on very long term thinking uh, and are, you know, in off many cases is uh, still controlled by the original family uh, or the founding families. Uh, Burberry doesn't have that. It's 100% free float. Uh, and the logical mm. question is, you know, how much longer can it remain one? Uh, yet, it, it's hard to see what, you know, a buyer, a private equity buyer could do differently in terms of cutting costs. It's not about cost cutting. Uh, it's much more about elevating the brand and repositioning it. And it's possibly that it fits in more with a trade buyer than private mm. equity at this stage. But why would going up market be the right way to go for Burberry? Would it have more appeal to private equity or another buyer if it did something different? I think the question for Burberry is to elevate sales densities. And the uh, the, the best way the industry has been able to do that is generally to elevate price positioning, uh, to become part of this rarefied group of companies that have pricing power. And you can do that when you elevate your positioning uh, and are offering consumers something that they're willing to pay higher prices for. And that's really the appeal of the sector, particularly now in an inflationary time, is its superior pricing power. Uh, Burberry, however, is still in the middle of its transition and hasn't quite uh, made that jump into the league where it can charge consumers what it wants. It still has a sizable outlet business, for instance, which it's trying to unwind out of. Would it fit into one of the big conglomerates? I think that has been uh, a, a, a hypothesis for the last decade now, but it hasn't happened. So it's uh, still a question mark. I think the bigger, for some of the truly big conglomerates, maybe Burberry is still too small in terms of size for it to truly make a difference. So I wonder if more of a mid-sized conglomerate uh, uh, might be the answer for Burberry, such as, you know, potentially maybe what Exor is trying to do by hoovering up certain brands 
Italy. Uh, I don't know if uh, Burberry is at all on their radar, but potentially that is the kind of company that this might fit in with. Is there something that Burberry could do and show that would change the game for them in terms of looking more attractive? I think really the question is on uh, consumer appetite for their designs. Ricardo Tisci's designs have been well received, but perhaps not uh, generated quite the same amount of fever that, say, Alessandro Michele's designs did when he took over at Gucci, which mm. really, you know, catalyzed a dramatic uh, transformation of that brand. Uh, and so maybe more creative momentum, which uh, really captures consumers' imagination is what they need. And then on the product side, this has historically been a company that's been, been very apparel-driven. Uh, and so the more they can reduce their dependence on apparel and increase in leather goods, uh, where the margins are higher, uh, that's really something that they could do in order to uh, increase the margins overall. Mm. You talked about the management turnover. We're about to get another management turnover. Jonathan Ackerrod's about to take over the business. Do you buy, do you front-run that into him taking over? Well, he's certainly a very capable operator, and the message today from the call from the chairman of Burberry was that, and the CFO was that we shouldn't expect any dramatic shift to the strategy, and that he's well on board with the strategy and the repositioning that's underway. Um, and, and you know, he's definitely a very capable operator, but uh, again, there's a, a limit to how much perhaps he can do or the management can do in the absence of the product really resonating with the consumer, which is the question mark right now. Mm. Sweeter, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Sweeter Ramachandran, GAM Investment Manager, covering the luxury sector on Burberry today. Thank you very much indeed. A little bit of a dip as we come into the end of trading through the auction process uh, here in Europe. The FTSE 100, though, still positive, uh, up by six tenths of 1%. Also, trader a factor. Uh, we have those talks about Burberry, bit of a drag on the London market today. The DAX up by one tenth of 1%. The Cancurons uh, up 2%. Uh, but we have hit fresh record uh, highs today, uh, 485 for the stock 600, Alex. And a large part of that is going to be what's happening with some of the gold stocks. So let's go to that uh, coming up. We're going to talk about inflation heating up and gold's role in that. Higher again, the stock's really outperforming. Can that continue? Is Bitcoin taking the spotlight? Uh, we'll break all that down with Damien Corvalin, Goldman Sachs head of energy research, joins us with his outlook. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, a European close. I'm Richard Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Michelle Myers, the Bank of America head of U.S. economics. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Ritika Gupta. The British economy grew less than the Bank of England forecast, plus consumer spending showed signs of weakening. That leaves the chances of an interest rate increase in December in the balance. Gross domestic product rose 1.3 percent in the third quarter. Belarus is ramping up the pressure over all those migrants from the Middle East seeking to cross into European Union territory. President Alexander Lukashenko says if Poland closes the door to the migrants, Belarus will shut down a pipeline carrying Russian natural gas gas to the EU. About 20% of Russian gas flows to the EU crossed Belarus this year. Next week, the European Union will lay out a $46 billion infrastructure plan to counter China's Belt and Road program. According to a draft seen by Bloomberg, the plan is aimed at boosting Europe's competitiveness and interest around the world. It will focus on digital transport, energy and trade projects. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. Uh, so for much of this year, rising inflation has been bad news for gold, which is ironic because usually it's supposed to be good for gold. Now the, the metal's getting a little bit of a shot in the arm here, uh, up by about $11 an ounce. Now Goldman Sachs has a price target of $2,000 pretty much for the rest of this year and next year. Let's talk to the guy behind the call, Damian Corvalin, Goldman Sachs head of energy research, uh, joins us now for his insights. So a couple things. One, I could say, hey, inflation's super high. Why isn't gold already at $2,000? And the other is, oh, great, finally gold's going to work as an inflation hedge, which is it. I think it really uh, is a shift right now. I think if you look at the last six months, it's been, you know, gold is not really necessary because we do have a bit of inflation. It's transitory, but that's just because we have good growth after that. And so it really doesn't belong uh, in any portfolio. 
think now because of the persistence of inflation, then the risks are increasingly uh, that this inflation could prove quite persistent, surprise to the upside like it has recently for a long period of time. And suddenly the value of gold in a portfolio makes a lot more sense. So that's one. It's only one of several drivers, but I think that's the one that has changed most recently in investors positioning towards gold. If interest rates start to really rocket, where does that leave gold? Where does that leave silver? So I think the key question is, you know, what is moving within uh, the uh, interest rates, right? So, you know, long dated interest rates and really real rates um, is what tends to matter most for gold. Um, you know, as so far break evens widen, then that's actually been a tailwind for gold. Um, and, you know, I think what's key here is gold has actually been depressed it's really since mid June hasn't really rallied when real rates were uh, moving in a supportive direction. Mm -hmm. Even now the dollar is rallying and gold's finally catching a bit. So I think it really echoes uh, this, the, the view that investors had pretty much neglected gold. Um, you know, after that big reflation questioning in June, yeah. um, probably some crypto cannibalization for sure. I think we're just at, you know, trough fundamental levels of allocation to gold. And the moves from here on the rate side um, are supportive and, and are leading to that new bid for gold. I'm glad you brought up the crypto because I wondered if just investors were doing other things as an inflation hedge, whether that is buying crypto or whether that's in fact buying the gold stocks that are going to have uh, potentially more upside than the underlying metal, at least that's what it's looked at in the past. Are you seeing any evidence of that currently? I think it's actually starting. So, you know, we kind of have argued historically that, you know, crypto and gold do not have to cannibalize each other. You know, in fact, you know, the value of crypto is its network, just like the value of oil is the fact that it's consumed. Gold, like diamonds and art, doesn't have that. It's just a pure defensive asset um, that can, you know, outperform over a significant period of time. But it's a fact. We've seen substitution recently. Now, there's one evidence, I think, that demonstrate that is China, right? So late uh, September, China started to ban crypto. And we've actually uh, seen a sign now of strong gold demand in China. Um, so, you know, we're not arguing that, you know, crypto everywhere needs to be banned for gold to find a bid, but it does demonstrate that so far it's been a headwind. Now, just like we argue silver is a poor man's gold, you know, gold is maybe becoming the poor man's crypto. Um, and mm -hmm. at this point, there may be enough uh, wealth to allocate to both, especially, I think, as that inflation uh, signal is starting to, uh, to be more pressing. What are central banks doing right now with their gold stocks? Yeah, that's important. So really, let's just take a step back. When you think about gold, there are three forms of demand. There's the investors, which is mostly a DM investor response to inflationary risk. There's the EM consumer, which we'll talk about next, I'm sure, which you know just allocates as it gets wealthier. And then the central banks, which historically have had gold reserves. And what's been missing really for the last five years there is excess savings uh, for uh, those central banks. Now think about Russia, right? As oil prices have recovered, they are now well above uh, Russia's fiscal break even, and reserves are accumulating. Now, there is no other real asset a central bank can hold really than gold, and so naturally that's leading to higher gold allocation. So when you think about our forecast for sustained higher commodity prices, in particular oil, that just is now a natural reallocation, mm -hmm. recycling flow from central banks into gold, which I think is noteworthy because it's really been missing the last well, several years. Damien, you mentioned the EM consumer, and, and in theory, you get higher inflation in those countries, and yes, you want to get the physical assets like gold jewelry, for example, but they're just, they're, there's so much input costs that consumers are struggling with right now as inflation is high kind of everywhere, and wages in theory aren't really keeping pace as, as high as inflation. Do those consumers that we rely on still have enough extra cash to spend on gold? I think uh, you know the evidence of India suggests that uh, as those countries finally move uh, beyond COVID, you are seeing uh, that gold demand. You know, it, it may be also a simple assessment of consumer confidence uh, and a deployment of uh, some of their uh, income on gold. But you know, it really appears that as we're seeing the EMs outside of China finally, with a significant lag, benefit from vaccination, we are finding a bid for uh, gold on the jewelry side. And that's that third tenor, right? So we talked about China and the rest of the EMs are starting to show up as well. So I think that's the stronger footing on the demand side across all forms of demand that argues for uh, higher gold prices here. How high do we go? Where does silver go? Where does gold go? 
Well, so, you know, silver always has a high beta. So just think about, you know, if gold has a big move, silver typically will outperform. Our base case is gold goes to 2000. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, oh, and that's probably early next year, we have to then assess really what are those inflationary risks? Are they building to the upside? In which case there's a clear uh, case for even higher gold prices. Or eventually to finally see signs that uh, this is indeed transitory. So, you know, I think the first leg for us is relatively clear. After that, I think one uh, should be open to even further upside. Hey, Damon, uh, we don't have a ton of time, but I did want to, I can't let you go without asking uh, about oil. I feel like we're in a standoff between Saudi Arabia and President Biden. Um, what do you think President Biden's going to actually do to try and lower oil prices in the short term? What are the options? Sure. So, you know, first, uh, the U.S. government, the EIA, projects lower prices, so it's less Im immediate and urgent to, uh, to do something. The easiest option, of course, is an SPR release or a swap, right? You can bring forward some sales. That helps. It's a few dollars per barrel impact. doesn't really help gasoline, which is really where the issue is. The second option would be to uh, modify the biofuel mandates in the U.S. to make them less onerous uh, to consumers. That actually directly impacts gasoline prices. So those are the two options. But the real key here is it doesn't solve anything. And in fact, yeah. if the SPR was very bearish, it would only make us more bullish oil. Because here's the key message. At $80, $85, we're not seeing enough CapEx upstream investment. So lower, we're not seeing it. And the forward curve is well below that. So the whole oil complex has to be priced higher here. Damien, it's always great to get your insight. Thank you very much indeed for sharing some of it with us today. We really appreciate it. Damien Corbelin, Goldman Sachs Head of Energy Research. Greatly appreciated. This is Bloomberg. Fifty-two minutes past the hour, live from London. I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele, of course, over in New York. This is the European close on Bloomberg Markets. Talking of markets, let's figure out what is moving stateside. Bond markets closed, of course, for Veterans Day, but stocks very much trading, and it looked like uh, tech is having an interesting day. The, the stocks, in particular, semiconductors. Let's sort of start off there. Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle has the details. Well, Guy, the chips and tech really outperforming, and probably because the bond market is closed, we don't have to worry about yields rising, backing up in the way that they did yesterday. Here you can see some of the top performers for the S&P 500 and the SOX. NVIDIA up 2.2%, getting a 49% price increase, price target increase from Oppenheimer to $350 uh, per share ahead of earnings next week. So analysts super, super bullish. Then you see lots of the Apple suppliers higher as well. Big bounce back from yesterday. As for some of the individual movers, in fact, the top leaders and laggards for the S&P 500. Among the leaders, take a look at Freeport McMoran, up 9%. You all were just talking about commodities. Copper and gold really helping out Freeport trade higher, and perhaps that's an inflation hedge right there, the shares of Freeport McMoran. Tapestry up 9.7%, the best day of the year. Very strong quarter. The Coach brand doing exceptionally well. 26% growth. They also increased, doubled the buyback to a billion dollars. To the downside, though, Organon down 6.1 percent. This, of course, was the uh, women's health spin out from Merck earlier this year. They beat estimates, but they're making an acquisition. Perhaps that's why shares are down. And then the big one, Disney, down 7.1 percent off of the lows. Uh, but they clearly, the subscriber growth, not there in the way uh, that folks wanted to see it. 2.1 million subscribers, not enough. Plus, they, of course, missed on both adjusted earnings and revenues. As for yesterday's big stock, though, Alex, let's check in on Rivian because the electric truck maker, it is really on fire out of the IPO gate in a very strong way, up 59.5%. Let's call it 60%. That's pretty incredible, Alex, given the fact that this uh, company now has a market cap that is only behind, I think it's Toyota and Volkswagen, uh, Daimler right there. Only 1,200 trucks by the end of the year, but you have to give it, and I know that guy, you love uh, uh, the aesthetics of uh, cars and cars in general. Um, the trucks, <laughs> great looking. What do you think, Alex? I like cars. Okay, <laughs> you like cars too. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's Alec, funny. Alex bought, a, Alex bought a green car. 
with it's, very nice. It's a forest Subaru. green, really. I mean, we, we named yeah. it Jasper. It's a nice green Jasper color. Green. Jasper uh, green. Jasper green. Jasper green. That's why we got the name. Uh, but but yes, to that point though, like I said, those Rivian trucks do look really cool. Those headlights are like robot-like. Anyway, Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. So coming up in the next 24 hours, guy, it feels a little light, but there are a couple things I want to key in on. It's the final day of the UN COP26 conference, and then Bank of England's uh, Jonathan Haskell uh, will be speaking at UK CPI next week. So that's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, we get in Eurozone Industrial Production, which we're going to be watching out for uh, University of Michigan, consumer sentiment. I know this is a firm favourite of this programme. I think it breaks in our hours. I'm very much looking forward to exactly what it, that data is going to tell us about where the consumer is right now in the inflation story. It is 100% my desert indicator because the sentiment part, I think, is really fascinating, plus the outlook for inflation. All right, that wraps it up for me and Guy on TV. Coming up, Michelle Meyer, Bank of America, head of U.S. Economics, will be joining Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And Guy and I are also headed to radio. We are. The cable show That's coming up. <laughs> we're going to be doing it. We're looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic. I thought you were going to do this, but you're not. But anyway, we're going to radio as well. This is Bloomberg.